In this video, we're going to be discussing the test item cluster for subacromial impingement syndrome, or SAPS. This cluster was evaluated by Park et al. in 2005. If you suspect that your patient has subacromial impingement, you might consider performing these three tests, and those are the Hawkins-Kennedy test, the painful arc sign, and the infraspinatus manual muscle test, also called the resistant infraspinatus test. Now, as standalone tests, each of these has individual psychometric properties, like sensitivity and specificity that you can see right there. We'll cover those later in the video. However, the advantage of doing all three of these tests is you get to pool the results, and depending on how many of the three are positive, it gives you a specific positive likelihood ratio. Remember, the higher the positive likelihood ratio, the more likely it is that the person has that condition specific to the cluster. Now, when any two of these tests are positive, doesn't matter which two, the positive likelihood ratio for subacromial impingement is 5.03. When all three are positive, the positive likelihood ratio jumps to 10.6. A positive likelihood ratio of 5 would be moderately good, so there's a decent chance that they have subacromial impingement. Anytime you have a positive likelihood ratio of at least 10, that is an excellent likelihood ratio, and then it is very likely that they have that condition. So if you really want to confidently say that a patient has subacromial impingement, you really need all three of these tests to be positive because that gives you a positive likelihood ratio of at least 10. Now that we understand this test item cluster, let's go into each individual item or test. We're now going to talk about the painful arc test. This test is a component of two test item clusters. One is for subacromial impingement syndrome, and the other is for a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Before we go any further into this other stuff, let's just look and see how the test is done. It's very simple. You're going to have the patient in standing like I am here, and then the patient will actively abduct their shoulder through its entire range of motion, whatever range of motion they have. I don't have either of those conditions, so I'm able to get my arm up all the way to approximately 180 degrees, but if a patient has one of these two conditions, don't expect them to be able to get the arm up that far. Now, if we look at the psychometrics here, the sensitivity is very low. It's only 0.33, so it's very bad at ruling out a condition, given this test is negative. But the specificity is moderately good. It's 0.81, meaning that if a patient has a positive painful arc test, there's an 81% chance that they have one of these two conditions right here. So, what constitutes a positive painful arc test? It would be reproduction of the patient's shoulder pain. However, it's going to occur over a particular arc of motion. When we say an arc like this, we mean a range of angles. The study that investigated the painful arc test defined those angles between 60 degrees of abduction and 120 degrees of abduction. Now, clinically speaking, you may see it as low as 45 degrees. And so a lot of times when you Google this, like this picture here, you'll see that painful arc between 45 degrees and 120. When you're doing this in the clinic, does it really matter if it's exactly 60 or 50 or 45 or 40 degrees? No, there's just an arc of pain as they go through shoulder abduction, okay? So if they have that arc of pain, that would be considered a positive test. Now, this test is also useful because it can help you differentiate between a rotator cuff tear and subacromial impingement syndrome. So this is not a hard and fast rule, but it seems to be pretty widespread throughout patients. If somebody has a true rotator cuff tear, the entire active range of motion of abduction will be painful, meaning it'll still be painful from 45 degrees to 120, However, it will also be painful from 0 to 45, meaning that as I go from my arm to my side right here, all the way up, that entire active range of motion is going to be painful. Now, other than being a part of these two test item clusters, there's another really important utility of the painful arc test. It can help us differentiate between a rotator cuff tear and subacromial impingement syndrome. So let's suppose somebody has a true rotator cuff tear. There my arm is by my side, and now I'm abducting it all the way. If I had a rotator cuff tear, it would not just be painful between 45 degrees and 120. 
it would also be painful from zero to 45 degrees, meaning that pain would occur throughout the entire active range of motion of abduction. Now it might be worse in some areas than others, but the whole movement generally will be painful. If somebody has true impingement syndrome, they probably will not have pain between zero and 45. The pain will actually begin at 45 degrees and will continue on upward. So really it's that first 30, 40, 45 degrees of abduction that helps you differentiate between a rotator cuff tear and impingement syndrome. So hopefully that makes sense. We're now going to look at the Hawkins-Kennedy test, which is unique to the subacromial impingement test item cluster. Before we go into how the test is done, let's take a look at the psychometrics right here. The sensitivity ranges between 0.62 and 0.92, depending on the study that investigated it. On average, it's probably going to fall in the mid 80s. So this actually has pretty good utility in ruling out subacromial impingement syndrome. Now the specificity ranges all the way from 0.25 to 100%. Given that wide range, I wouldn't rely on that specificity as much. In short, I'd say the sensitivity here is a little bit better as an individual test. So if you want to quickly screen and rule out subacromial impingement syndrome, you can use the Hawkins-Kennedy test. And if the test is negative, there's roughly an 80-85% chance that they do not have impingement syndrome. So how is this test done? Well, you can have the patient either standing or seated. I've got the patient seated right here. I think it's a little bit easier to perform the test. And I'm gonna passively flex their shoulder up to about 90 degrees of flexion with the elbow bent to 90 degrees. Once I get to that position, I'm gonna maintain that position and then passively move their shoulder through internal rotation throughout that range of motion. And a positive test is gonna be reproduction of their familiar shoulder pain. Understand that as I'm moving through this internal rotation right here, they may compensate by hiking this shoulder up. That could be due to pain. It could also be due to limited range of motion. Understand that that compensation does not constitute a positive test, but it's something that is often seen in subacromial impingement syndrome. The positive test specifically is reproduction of familiar pain. We're now gonna talk about the resisted infraspinatus test, also called the resisted external rotation test. In reality, this is just an external rotation manual muscle test for the shoulder. And notice it's a part of two test item clusters, one for subacromial impingement syndrome and another for full thickness rotator cuff tear. If we look at the psychometrics, the specificity isn't great, it's 0.74, but the sensitivity as a standalone test is 0.90 or 90%. Given this higher sensitivity, this means that we can use this test as a screening tool to rule out one of these two shoulder pathologies. So if we do a resisted infraspinatus test and the result is negative, that means that there's a 90% chance that they do not have these two conditions, subacromial impingement syndrome or a full thickness rotator cuff tear. Now the way you perform this test is identical to how you do the manual muscle test because it is a manual muscle test. You can have the patient in standing or seated. I'd prefer to have them in seated like you see right here. The patient's gonna begin with their shoulder in neutral, meaning arm and elbow by the side. The elbow is gonna be bent to 90 degrees like this and their thumb is going to be face up. And what I'm gonna do as the practitioner is I'm gonna apply a force on their forearm, trying to push their forearm inwards, and they're gonna resist by trying to attempt to move the shoulder into external rotation. So here I am applying that inward force, and he's gonna resist that by using his shoulder external rotators. A positive test here is gonna be reproduction of the patient's familiar shoulder pain, and we'll probably also see weakness on that side compared to the unaffected side. Now obviously this would be a negative test because one, there was no weakness and also there was no pain reported with this force. One more thing, when you're doing this test, make sure that the patient's arm and elbow stays against their side. Sometimes if there's weakness or extreme pain, they may compensate by allowing their forearm to come in, but then their arm flares out. 